everyone. We're back here for another exciting book with our fabulous teacher, Father Juan. And uh, we're considering a new book of Richard Lohr's, which will help us have a perspective about scripture that is more inclusive of the whole picture of scripture rather than just microscopic parts of scripture. So we will, uh, let me do offer a beginning prayer. Okay, yeah. we'll talk about the introduction in first chapter tonight. And uh, Yeti is trying to set this thing up so that it works. Give us just a minute. Here. I think well, you got it. Okay, looks fine. You got it. Good job. Come on. Yeah. Thank you, Lord, for the love you give us and the ways you give us to share and to teach us from your word who we are and who you are that we are in you. So bless this teaching and the sharing tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, we're, back in, uh, we're back in session with uh, Father Richard Rohr. Uh, and he's going in a, a little bit different direction than we went last time. However, if you read carefully, you will see that what we talked about and what we learned in the last class dovetails very nicely with what we're studying this time. In fact, uh, some of the concepts uh, that he talks about are uh, going to be particularly relevant as we talked about the, the second halves of our lives. So in this, uh, we're going to we're going to roll into this uh, fairly slowly uh, with a chapter and an introduction. Uh, a, we we have a little longer to spend on this book, so um, your reading probably will not be as stressed as the last one where we covered a lot of material in a short period of time. So we start. Uh, with the concept, what he calls um, connecting the dots. That's the that's the introduction, and he goes into what is going to be laid out in the course of this book. But in the course of this book, and I particularly like the first the first quote because it speaks to a number of issues that he brings up in the first chapter when he says, "In your goodness." You let the blind speck of you let the blind speak of your light, and so what we're looking at here is we're looking at uh, um, where where is God, and I I'm going to move th through a couple of things and make this um, very interactive. I've highlighted some points out of the first chapter. And I want to uh, I want to dovetail off of those points and uh, offer some questions and some commentary that we can share based on that. Does that sound like a good idea? Yeah. Okay. So um, one of the premises, I got to say, the premise, um, one of the primary premises of chapter one is, uh, I find, based on, um, on a quotation from uh, D.H. Lawrence. And the quotation is, the world fears a new experience more than anything, because a new experience displaces so many old experiences. We've talked about this numerous times in the last class about change and how change is something that is makes us uncomfortable 
we don't like to change. We like to we like things familiar. And so D.H. Lawrence is suggesting that um, the world fears that. The world fears change because the new experiences that we encounter in change necessarily, I won't say displace perhaps, but it rocks our prior understandings. And what happens is, and we can see that in our secular world, as uh, as we see new uh, understandings of uh, past events, past history, and it upsets people to uh, to think that the things that we perhaps grew up and learned all along the way that uh, uh, perhaps maybe Christopher Columbus, for example, since that's the most recent uh, holiday, that perhaps Christopher Columbus was not uh, as we learned about it uh, so many years ago when we were singing in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. We're now finding that Christopher Columbus uh, perhaps uh, needs to be re-examined and people are uncomfortable with that because in, in visiting Christopher Columbus, it displaces those things that made us, or were so comfortable for us as we were learning them. And I think that's a, I think that's a, uh, a natural um, consequence of our lives as human beings. We like to have things uh, boxed and put into uh, uh, a nice container and there we can put it out and look at it when we want to without necessarily having to do any further uh, any further work on that. So that's what D.H. Lawrence suggest and then I have a question for you that I'd like you to to reflect on and, and respond to the Chris the um, the DH Lawrence quote what does that mean exactly what does the world fearing new experiences because they displace old experience what does that mean let's have some thought around that Again, I can refer to, now this isn't necessarily a religious thing, but things in history that are being disclosed to us now that we were never taught. Mm -hmm. For example, when we had recently had the 100th anniversary of the just destruction of Tulsa, of the mm -hmm. Black Town in, in Tulsa, that was a totally new story to me. Mm -hmm. I, had, I had never heard that. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, for me, it was astounding. For but for a lot of people, it was very threatening mm -hmm. that that would be disclosed. And I mean, we have here in my little town of Fallbrook, we have people going before the school board screaming that they don't want to have their children taught critical race theory. Mm -hmm. And it's nowhere on. I mean, I'm, if such a thing exists. It is nowhere on the, on the curriculum, but it really has people wrought up. And so that's like a new idea that's come along that really has shaken the foundations of some places that some people are stuck. Absolutely. And uh, I think it was Newton that said for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, speaking mm -hmm. in the physical world. And right. so whenever these sorts of bedrock things are are uh, tumbled or uh, are they are approached it causes an equal and opposite reaction just the other day I heard that uh, in the state of Texas they're proposing that uh, there needs to be taught the uh, opposing viewpoint on the Holocaust right you know yeah. that that the opposing and what, and what the, can that be the only thing that i can the only thing that i can be having uh having had the opportunity to 
to visit a couple of concentration camps. The only thing that uh, that, that can mean is that we are teaching the uh, the final solution Aryan theory that was proposed by Adolf Hitler. That's the opposite view. That's the only thing that can mean to me. And, uh, and, and that I think that's an example of what you're saying and what's also D.H. Lawrence is saying is that we are reluctant to experience these new things because they shake our roots. They displace our old things. And from a, from a spiritual perspective, we find that particularly uh, troubling, I think, in terms of, uh, of spiritual growth. I think we've talked about this before, about the, the, the ages and stages of faith development. And what happens is that majority of people, if they continue to learn anything at all, about faith and spirituality, they get fixated at about the age of 14 or 15 at the time that they had their last official church ritual or rite. There's a confirmation or a bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah, whatever. They're operating from a spiritual level of a 14-year-old uh, education. So when we get new things that uh, approach us spiritually. We have a natural tendency, I think, to want to shut those things down because they rock our world. They make us have to go back and rethink some of the things that we were taught. So I guess the question then is, if this is true, if D.H. Lawrence and what we're talking about, if this fact is true, and I'm and I'm 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 thinking that and I'm hearing that it is true, that we believe that to be true, why is that? Why is it that we are uh, reluctant to go visit these new areas? What keeps us from being curious? Seekers. Fear. Yeah, Fear. It's, thre it's threatening to mm -hmm. uh, the, the people, the ones currently in power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nobody likes to have their worldview shaken up. Mm -hmm. Right. And yet, as we read scripture, if we read the Hebrew scripture, we find that the that the, the Hebrews whole existence throughout the Old Testament was one of being shaken up. Their whole existence was shaken up. They were constantly and consistently in a uh, in turmoil, whether they were being carried off into captivity or slavery by some other power or whatever the case might be. Maybe it was a, an, an evil and arrogant uh, king in their midst. So the very nature of scripture as we read in the, New Te in the Old Testament, in the, Hebrew, in the Hebrew Bible, is one of turmoil. It is one of change. It is one of shakeup. And then when we come into our Christian scripture with Jesus, Jesus says very, very succinctly that I, you know, I came into the world to shake it up. I came into this world not to bring comfort, but I came to shake things up. And that message got him killed. Martha. I like what Richard did about saying that you look at scripture, across scripture, there's a clear set of patterns and a tangent. We have to connect the dots both forward and backward. Mm -hmm. Because human beings progress a little bit and then they regress. They progress a little bit, they regress. Mm -hmm. It's a straightforward progression. 
sometimes our understanding doesn't evolve except with setbacks, which is what our last book by Roy Exactly. Was. Thank you. Thank you for making that connection. That's that's exactly <laughs> what uh, what Richard says is that uh, you know it's our, our history is one of taking two steps forward and one step back and three steps forward and two steps back and you know maybe even in that necessity necessary failures we we're taking two steps back to get one step forward and i'm i'm reminded of a particular psychological profile it's a very common one there are different types of depression that you can have profiles for but this one always struck me and stuck with me it's a profile in which the person is depressed and feeling that, uh, you know, things are not worthwhile, but it's one in which they fear getting out of the depression because of the change. Mm -hmm. They would rather stay in their known misery them to move into something that they don't know exactly and it's a, a very common profile where people are stuck mm -hmm. known misery is known and you can predict it and you know what's going to happen and you can be just uh miserable you can be happy in your misery in the sense that at least everything is predictable. There's not going to be anything to rock the boat. Right. Yeah. That's why a lot of people stop taking their meds. Mm hmm And why you have domestic violence victims returning to their abusers continually because they uh, that that feels familiar to them. You know, making a, perhaps making a change uh, to get out of that situation is is scary or so scary that they'd rather stay in a situation perhaps that uh, is literally lethal. I think I talked about the frog in the, in the, in the terrarium. The, ter the terrarium uh, gets so hot that it eventually cooks the frog, but the frog is familiar with everything. And, and if you put enough uh, incentives around the frog, the frog will stay in a lethal situation rather than get out of it. But we do know, we can, uh, I appreciate your comment, uh, uh, Gay, about the medications, but on the other hand, some of us are born with different, shall we say, diversity in brains. That's mm -hmm. the best phrase. What's that phrase again? Diversity in brains? Diversity in brains. Okay. Brain. Neurodivergence. Neurodivergence, exactly. Neuro, okay. And so there are some of us that are neurodivergent, and maybe there is a medication that helps make up for what our own brains can't produce. Mm -hmm. I don't think that any of us who take medications will ever say that solves our problems. Mm -hmm makes our brains work a little better so maybe we can think about it more clearly. <laughs> no, I wasn't denigrating the medications. What I was saying is that people are are so comfortable in their depression or they're so familiar with their depression let's say, mm -hmm. that they stop taking their meds that yes. are ostensibly making them feel better. Right. Indeed. One of the things that uh, Richard says in chapter one, he talks about uh, how God, uh, how God evolves. And it's, he says that the Hebrew God this different God than the God of Jesus. It is not that the Hebrew God is a different God than the God of Jesus. It's that 
we are growing up as we move through the scripture, through the text, and deepen our experience. God does not change, but our readiness for such a God takes a long time to change. So we have this basic uh, uh, predestination, so we say, to, uh, to be adverse to change. And yet, as God evolves for us, that change becomes evident. And the question that I have for you is, how has God changed for you? Has God changed for you? And if so, how? How did that happen? I think he's become more incomprehensible mm -hmm. by my mind. And I have a greater appreciation for, for the void or um, lack of discursive meaning. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's, I think what happens, uh, what happens to us um, as we grow spiritually, I'll speak for myself, as, as I evolve and grow spiritually, things that were certainties in my uh, earlier belief system, things that were certainties become more uncertain. In fact, uh, the closer I get to God and the deeper my spiritual understanding becomes, the mystery deepens for me. It, uh, it is not as, uh, as cut and dry as what I may have learned uh, many years ago in, uh, in religious education classes. It's becoming tolerant of not knowing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Being able to tolerate knowing that you're not going to know everything. Mm -hmm. Even what you know, you know, is only a piece of it. And as you move through your life, you're going to see the same things differently. Mm -hmm. Because I think as we read scripture, I think that many of us grew up, whatever tradition we grew up in, we had a certain take on scripture, maybe it was not even relevant or used. And then we began to read it and pay a little bit more attention to it, maybe through the, the lectures in church. But as you progress, you realize more and more that you know less and less. <laughs> exactly. It's not the kind of fear associated with it. It's not insecure. There's a security in knowing that you don't know it. That you don't know, right. There's a in saying it's okay not to know everything. Mm -hmm. Well, that makes you sound more open to listen to what there is more to say, to reveal. And what the scripture is saying, what the spirit is saying to you, uh, all of those things are operative. And, um, you know, it's okay to know that you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. That's okay. And that's, that's, a, that's a point of spiritual growth, I think, is when we get to the point where it's okay not to know. We're not at, we don't have, you know, in the back of the, in the back of the book of life, there is not a teacher's edition that has all of the answers to the questions in the book. I like the where in where in this chapter where because we're always look for I was always look reading, looking for the rules, looking mm -hmm. for the rules of life, of how I should live my life. To, mm -hmm. and he says, uh, I know there were times when all of us have wished the Bible were some kinds of seven habits for, for highly effective people. Just <laughs> give us the right conclusions. <laughs> that was um, all right. Yeah, very insightful. Yes. Yeah. 
instead of trying to figure things out, we were just looking for the answers. They're, was, not, they're not obvious. I thought that was, uh, I thought that was uh, an interesting um, reference that he made because that was a very popular book by Stephen Covey, the right. you know the the Seven Habits of Very Effective People, mm -hmm. and uh, Stephen Covey was uh, was is uh, a very uh, religious person and in uh, and in the uh, in the hierarchy at some level within the LDS church. So I, I always thought that that was, kind of, I thought that was kind of an interesting, I didn't know if that was a tongue in cheek reference on the part of Richard Rohr or uh, just uh, an interesting, uh, an interesting sidebar by him. One of the things that he quotes, uh, he quotes a theologian who was quite uh, quite prevalent during the Vatican Vatican II? He quotes uh, Henry de Lubac, uh, and Lubac suggests that there are two alternating and here's his this is his word mediocrities, two alternating mediocrities. That's an interesting word, uh, and he says the first one is all heart and head. It's sweet and nice, but it's not going to transform history. It can be a cover for pride and prejudice. That's the first mediocrity that he talks about. And he calls that the, uh, the, conservative, uh, the conservative option. And as I was, uh, as I was looking at that, uh, I was thinking about, um, some of the religious celebrations, shall I say, or religious uh, encounters that I've had with, uh, with some traditions that everything is, everything is, uh, is all right. Everything is, is, um, uh, is roses. Everything is is uh, is so good, and that there's no uh, no negatives of life. And if you are not, if you are experiencing anything that is negative in your life, if you are going through any particular things in your life, it's because you are not faith filled. You're not, uh, something is wrong with your faith if you're experiencing anything that's less than joyous and wonderful. And I think that might be what uh, De Lubac is referring to in this first mediocrity. He's talking about those situations that are all heart and head and uh, doesn't leave room for uh, some of the things that we go through as human beings. Doesn't acknowledge that perhaps. And then he says the second mediocrity is all head and no heart. I believe he calls that the progressive, uh, the progressive option, and it puts the mind back in control. And you know, we all like to be in control, but the heart doesn't know anything gracious or new. And so I ask the question: Is how do you relax? How do you react, or do you relate at all to what Lubach is saying in this? these mediocrities that he talks about. I think some people more habitually stay in one half of their brain or the other. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can stay in the pattern that is logical, linear, uh, rational, sequential, and it will not be very creative, but it will follow the rules quite well. 
No, exactly. He says, Poor him. he says they do not really love God as much as talk about God. Mm -hmm. They have education rather than actual knowing. Mm -hmm. It's kind of as, as Mother Martha says, it's uh, the two type. <clears throat> what I consider two types of thinking. There's an algebraic way of thinking in which everything follows in a linear fashion and is logical and follows in what I call, not just me, but it's called geometric thinking in which we're looking at relationships and spatial, uh, spatial orientations. And how things come together, emotions, and everything. And if we have some of each, we can be in a middle path. Mm -hmm. Lean too much on the linear, you'll never read the scripture except like a fundamentalist. Right, it'll be very literal to you. Uh. <laughs> I just wish I had known about those types of, that, that type of thinking when I was in high school taking math because uh, algebra, algebraic uh, classes were very difficult for me and geometric classes were very easy for me. And uh, people were getting uh, upset about geometry. They couldn't make those relationships and I actually ended up being a tutor to people in geometry but the, uh, just the opposite when it came to algebra and obviously were you were you were you too are you too algebraic in your thinking Martha I didn't do well in algebra either <laughs> teacher in geometry flunked 19 out of the 26 people in the class, including the class president. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's a common thing in the teacher. It was horrible. <laughs> so, um, here's one that I like that he talks about. He says, God comes to us disguised as our life. Yeah. God's revelations are always concrete and specific. Revelation is not something you measure, but something or someone you meet. Now, we've talked, I think we've talked a little bit about that in our last book when we said that, you know, that, um, you know, life comes at you. And in those moments when life comes at you and you are feeling less than and perhaps maybe even had some failures, um, that is God perhaps coming at you disguised. And I ask, have you had a revelation experience? And what was it like? And how did it come about? When you least expect it. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, it comes about, uh, you know, life. Life comes about, uh, comes about, and one of the, in my, in my life, uh, God came to me uh, disguised in the form of my mother's death. And uh, I was going along, as they say, fat, dumb, and happy, and uh, figured because I knew how grief worked and how it was supposed to work, and I knew all the right, you know, sorry for your loss uh, platitudes, that I would skate through that loss of my mother. And in reality, the loss of my mother uh, ended up much like uh, Paul's experience on the road to Damascus. Mm. 
it knocked me literally off my horse, locked me into the middle of the road, knocked me into an area where I wandered in the desert and I wandered for 40 years. <laughs> it seemed like for 40 years, but it was life coming at me and, uh, and passing through that entire experience. When I got through to the other side, I realized much like that uh, old uh, poster that says that, you know, that God is walking by you and there's points where you see the was it footsteps or the footsteps in the sand. And uh, there was a time when uh, there was only one set of footsteps and that was when God was carrying me. That was what was happening in my life. And so life came at me in a way that I would have never anticipated or expected. And um, I try to resist it. I try to ignore it. But it got to the point where that was not possible. What I was trying to do was no longer working. I was no longer in control. And that was, uh, that was a good thing for me because I'm a control freak. And so that was a good thing for me to realize that I was spinning and I wasn't in control and I had to offer it up to God. That's how I met. That's how God came to me disguised in, in my life. And uh, that was a revelation experience. How old and, were you when she died? Pardon me? How old were you when she died? How old was I? Yeah. Or how, how old was she? How old yeah. was she? What was I? Was I? I was. Um, let's see. Fifty. Fifty-six. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you know, it, because she had been ill, and it was, you know, it wasn't a surprise. I thought that I would be able to react to it much differently than I did. And I didn't. And uh, I was uh, I was in a tailspin, and I spun for you know three years, four years. Oh. Yeah. And all of those things that you read about the stages of guilt or grief, the stages of grief, they're not linear and and they're not algebraic, and they don't come one after the other. They come randomly. You make a step. You think you're going in the right direction. And it's exactly what Richard Rohr is talking about. You make two steps forward and you slide back one. And you come back in a completely different area. That was revelation for me. It was painful. It, uh, it fundamentally changed the way I approach life. And it fundamentally changed my life. And it was something that I would not have, uh, I would not have uh, chosen for myself. And it's something that I would not wish upon anyone, but a friend of mine who was with me at that time and was perplexed by how I was flopping around like a freshly caught fish on the dock. He was perplexed by that. And then shortly after I had stabilized, he lost his wife. And he told me for the first time, he, he understood what I had gone through. It was the first time. And he, a very spiritual, very religious person, and he couldn't understand why I had been so blindsided knocked off until he experienced that same that same set of circumstances in his life and it took him to new places also in his spiritual growth in this book he's god he says god's favorite and most effective hiding places humility mm -hmm. and yeah, it's uh, that was a big, uh, you know, the, the, he talks about the cosmic egg. That experience cracked my egg wide open. You know, the, the all of the all of the all of the yolk came running out, 
of my egg. And that was my story was one of uh, of being ego driven and in control. And now I was my story was no longer one of being in control. I was out of control. I was floundering. Which leads me to that whole concept of the cosmic egg. Take a look at that diagram on, on page 23 if you have your book there. I had never seen this illustrated this way before. It's a, it's a very good uh, illustration, I think, in terms of the, uh, the concentricness of it, I think, is what I like about it, is that it, uh, it's not linear. It's not, um, it's not that algebraic. It's, uh, it's concentric. And you can, we can see when very visually how we and others can get so caught up in our story. And, um, and that becomes the focal point. And I think more importantly, as we were talking earlier about uh, how we resist or how people are, are challenged by things that rock their world, I think that speaks right to the our, our story. It's our group identities. It's our our sense of uh, you know being uh, American exceptionalism or uh, Christian exceptionalism or whatever whatever exceptionalism that we embrace as part of that story. And so when we have that story, uh, he calls it groupthink. When that group think becomes uh, gets rattled, that's when we feel this resistance, this equal and opposite reaction. Because not only is it threatening to us, it's threatening to the structure, which is the part that's our story. So that part becomes particularly problematic. And he talks about the, you know, the, the different things, ethnicity, nationalism, cultural, religion, uh, all of that contributes to our sense of self. And uh, when those things get pushed, when the egg gets pushed around a little bit, it becomes uh, uncomfortable for us. I think it's also a part of how you read scripture. Mm -hmm. And I'm reminded of some of our Supreme Court justices who posit the idea of reading the Constitution in mm -hmm. what they term originalism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the the founders meant when they wrote it, and you're going to follow that pretty literally, and you're going to block out any subsequent thinking or development that might uh, be a factor in how you interpret the Constitution. Mm -hmm. We have the same thing in religion. We have fundamentalist religion. We have liberal religion, which in the extreme of the new ageism is that everything is personalized and there is no stability in terms of is there a, a reality that we can agree on mm -hmm. we uh you know we can make it up as we go along in the extreme and our own interpretation rules over everything and we don't learn anything from the hundreds of years of wisdom that have been passed on to us in scripture. We interpret it in a very over-personalized manner, mm -hmm. really not taking into account how scriptural interpretation 
has developed over time in light of our current world. Mm -hmm. Not to say that the ancients didn't have sense. You know, their views of scripture are still profound. Mm -hmm. We can look at them in the light of other developments, whereas the constitutional originalist or the biblical fundamentalist seems uh, bound to a more literal interpretation and you don't expand it with mm -hmm. experience at all you, you try yep. to what you think it was and we're not very good at doing that even mm -hmm. when constitution we're not very good at going back a few hundred years and you try to go back two or three thousand years with scripture to try to infer what they meant by it when it was written in another language and that becomes a very difficult task <laughs> it is it is a difficult ask and what the the, the sad part about that um uh, is that uh, with the fundamentalists and the originalists, it takes the, the life and the breath out of, uh, out of the document, so to speak. You know, there is no way that uh, when Thomas Jefferson et al. sat down and, and, and penned that, that they would know anything about social media. So, you know, if you're trying to interpret what the originalists, trying to interpret social media issues based on what Thomas Jefferson thought. That's a, you know, that's a, uh, a straw, a straw elephant, straw, I'm, I'm mixing metaphors there, but it's a uh, straw elephant. I like it. Yeah, straw elephant. We'll call him a straw elephant. So, yeah, that's and the same is true of scripture. If this, if the scripture is not growing and being relevant to where we are as human beings in the 21st century, then it's a dead document. It's a dead. It's a dead. Uh, uh, a dead thing. And I think, uh, and many people find that uh, 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 is a turnoff to them because the fundamental uh, interpretations get a lot more press, they get a lot more uh, airtime. And so people look at that and they think, well, this is not relevant to me or my life. And in fact, the fundamentalists are killing off the lifeblood of the scripture by yeah. sticking to that fundamental interpretation. It's not it can't inspire. No, it can't. So the next thing that was significant in this chapter, which dovetails so very sweetly and nicely with what we talked about in the last book, is the concept of sacred wounding. Um, the personal significance of human pain and suffering. If we do not transform our pain, we will most assuredly transmit it. I love that line. That is so true. If we do not transform our pain, we will most assuredly transmit it. And I would add, a, I would add one thing to that. If we do not recognize and acknowledge our pain, we cannot transform it. And therefore we are, we are bound and determined to transmit that pain. Suffering is simply wherever you are, suffering is simply wherever you are not in control. And control is what we like to have. And I tell people in spiritual direction that 
Control is an illusion. Control is an illusion. We like to think there is some control. Yeah. We have, there is, it's an illusion. And it makes us uncomfortable because we like to be in control. We like to at least think we are in control. You know, UPS driver went to work the other day, sitting in his UPS truck, and an airplane falls out of the sky and hits him in his truck. What's the likelihood of that? What kind of control is that? You're sitting in your UPS truck and a plane falls out of the sky and takes you out. You have no control. That's an illusion. But we like to think that we have control. And so suffering is whenever we are not in control, we feel like we're suffering. And he, um, he talks about, well, he talks about some of the classics. Uh, he talks about Jonah. He talks about Job. But I would add one more to that to that list. It's a it's a it's a book that we don't often read because it's in the Deuterocanonical books, the Apocrypha, and I'm referring to Tobit. Tobit happens to be one of my favorites because here we have a, a man who is in in exile, trying to be a be a righteous person in the in the city of Nineveh, which was a city that uh, you know Jonah had been called to uh, to preach in, and Tobit is in Nineveh, and he has these horrendous things happen to him as he's trying to as he's trying to uh, to be a righteous Jew and do the right thing, and it's a tremendous. It's a tremendous story. It's a, it's a narrative. It's like a novel. It's, uh, it's poetic. And it happens to be one of my uh, favorite biblical accounts of suffering. Because when it all comes down, uh, he comes through the others. Just to not give it away if you're not familiar with Tobit. Not to give away the ending, but uh, let's just say he comes through to the other side, and uh, and that's a tremendous inspiration to me to read Tobit. So I would throw Tobit in there. If you haven't read Tobit, take a minute to read Tobit. It's a uh, it's an interesting story. It's a very, as I said, it's poetic and it's uh, uh, probably uh, probably as a more of a more folklore from that era, but it's uh, it's interesting. So sacred wounding is akin to necessary failure, necessary suffering. And the question I had to close with is, how have you experienced either one? Did your faith strengthen or waver through the sacred wounding or the necessary suffering, the necessary failure. Did your faith strengthen or did it waver? It strengthened. Strengthened? Yeah. How so? You want to share that, how it strengthened it? Sure. Um, nothing was sure. Nothing was certain. And the whole foundation, the whole floor I was sitting on shook like an earthquake and that's happened a number of times in my life and even with the recent diagnosis but the only thing um the only string that kept, keeps me standing up is that that felt presence of God mm -hmm. does that make sense absolutely I don't know if I'm making sense Yes, it does make sense. Yes. And it, it makes sense because I would venture to say that most of us here have experienced like that. If yeah. we were, if we were in a different, if we had a, a different composition of our class, perhaps that might not make sense, but I think we can all relate to that. And it makes, it makes undeniable sense. 
I don't, I have never blamed God. You know, um, a lot of people, even my friends about my situation are angry at God and go, why, why, why? It's sort of like, why not? You know, mm -hmm. this is a gift too. Everything mm -hmm. is a gift. Mm -hmm. It's all a gift. There's grace in everything. Yes, there is. Well, I think we have just about come to the end of our time together. Yes, Polly. I have a, a question, which I think maybe uh, have a factual answer. I'm not sure. The last page of chapter one, mm -hmm. he says, we've been given the tools for a very honest, critic, critical, historical analysis of the scripture ever since the 1940s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is he referring? The historical Jesus, I think, Father John, is that right? There was more emphasis on the historical Jesus, the historicity mm -hmm. of Jesus, um, which, to my mind, is pretty darn limited. Mm -hmm. Well, I think he um, is alluding to, and I think he actually said that, uh, you know, up until fairly recently, uh, scripture, the Bible was not something that the Catholic, the Roman Catholics were particularly adept at, or not familiar with scripture. Um, and certainly as Catholic theologians, starting probably in the 40s, got uh, more into scripture study, um, exegesis, and uh, critical theological study of scripture. That was not something that was, uh, that was fostered in the, in the Roman Catholic Church. And... Um, from the from the lay perspective, it was not something that was uh, featured until post Vatican II, which was in the sixties. Mm -hmm. So, uh, scripture study was not something that uh, that was familiar to uh, to most Catholics. But we now have an opportunity to do that. We're having an opportunity to study scripture, and we have some wonderful scripture scholars out there that come from a Catholic tradition. Now, what in the world had they had the right before then the 40s or the 60s to keep the word of God from the people to getting more God? This is a, I mean, it's it's damaging to humanity. Oh. Well, that's because they thought the Bible was dangerous, which mm -hmm. it is. It is dangerous. It's subversive. It's very dangerous. Yeah, it's subversive stuff. You know, they and, didn't uh, think people were smart enough. That's a part of it. You know, we're talking about, uh, you know, um, perhaps um, an immigrant church in the United States. Um, and people maybe not being as sophisticated uh, in their learning. And and clericalism. So, pardon me? Clericalism. Yes, exactly. Good word. Good word. And, uh, you know, we can say that that was a clerical error. <laughs> <laughs> That was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good friends. We are come to the end of our road. Would someone like to close us with a prayer? And Mother Leslie do it. Oh, Mother yeah. Leslie was. Okay, let's take a breath. Just a simple breath. 
be still and know that I am God. Be still and know. Be still. Be. Amen. Amen. Beautiful. Thank you. We'll do chapter two next week. Okay. 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 All right. Have a blessed week, everyone. Thank you. All right. I will see some of you on Sunday, I'm sure. Yeah. All right. Bye bye. Interesting.